things that you can do is something called um, uh, analysis of el elements. Analysis of elements or random assembly. And this is something I wanted to do on Friday, but we didn't get a chance. And I thought we'd do it just really quickly here, just to give you an idea of kind of relative placement of elements on your property. And when I talk about an element, what I'm saying is an element is a food forest, your greenhouse, a pond, a rain barrel, a tool shed, you know, all of these different things that you might, as homeowners, want to have on your property. So there's the design goals and visions, the larger, like, you know, our vision for our site is we want to be a cold climate permaculture demonstration site that inspires and educates people about permaculture, something like that, right? So that's the bigger goal and vision. But in my mind, it's like, well, I want a greenhouse, and I want chickens, and I want a pond, and I want a food forest, and you know, so then you have all the little details, patterns, details, and you start to fill those in. So in order to kind of just get people flowing on that, I want to do just a quick exercise. And then we're going to hear from Cindy in terms of what she wants, both on her design and vision for the properties, and then maybe some of the elements that you've thought through. So we're going to get actually back into a circle here. Um, and each of you is going to be an element. These guys don't have an attachment, so I'm the herb garden. So what we want to do is we want to see how all of these different elements are connected to one another. Right? So for example, the herb garden should probably be connected to the main veggie garden. Right? Because we want those kind of close by. So I'm going to ham this to the ray. Oh, I see. You're going to keep... You're going to keep... Yes. So where should... What should the veggie garden be connected to? Well, the compost. The compost, yeah. Yeah. The tool shed. So where should the compost be connected to? The main house. Yeah. The well, we'll assume the, the barn. houses. Maybe the barn because of the manure. Oh, the the manure, yeah. Yeah, so keep your little string. So the house is in the middle already. The house is, yeah. Whoop. So these are just all the elements that work. The chicken house too, baby. Chickens. Yeah, so the chickens. So the barn can be connected to the chickens, so you can hold that guy. Ducks. I don't know if you're watching. What should, the, right what should the chickens be connected to? Where Where do you use the chickens? On what's yours? Obies. Well, you want to watch them from the deck. <laughs> yeah, you definitely you do want to do that. Totally. You might want to watch the ducks. Yeah, yeah. The ducks and chickens live together? Can they go together? No, the ducks are probably the ponds. Now we're at the deck. Alright, I think I'm going to watch the ducks also. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Obviously, yeah. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. The rain barrel makes the pond. And the pond. You get the water from rain the rain barrel. Rain barrel. You could have the water barrel going into the pond. Yeah. You could. Yeah. But it's whatever the pond wants to do. Yeah, the pond uh, really could, wants to do. could be close to the... Yeah. Next to the greenhouse, actually. Sure. sure. Let's have the, the pond in front of the greenhouse. Well, there's still... Sun. Yeah, we can make multiple connections, so it can come back to that, too. Oh, okay. There we go. All right, so... Yeah, you can go to some of the garden and come to, right? Yeah. yeah. But I actually want the tool shed. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on to it. Oh. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. 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 The tool shed could be on the back of the greenhouse. There we go. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Sure. Yeah. So well, because then the trellis. then they make sure get the tools easily and use them in the greenhouse. Yeah. The the trellis trellis the kind of yeah. Tool. Frank, you have a trellis in the food forest. 
Excellent. Let's grow the grapes. I never can eat. I was going to say, it's you like it. You guys are amazing. And then we obviously need water, so. Because she's the only one left, right? You can go to someone that's already gone. Yeah. We're making multiple connections. Oh, yeah. oh. Yeah. Yeah. I see. Well, other than. The vegetarian. Try to get there. You got a lot of slack there. Oh. A lot of slack. That's because I was the most important. <laughs> <laughs> the pollinator. Well, that's really dry, so we need the rain barrel to, right, to um, water, water from there. Yeah. Yep. Uh, 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 what is you? Compost. Hey, you got water the compost. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is going to be interesting unraveling this. <laughs> <laughs> You just have to go backwards. Yeah. 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 So are we going to have one of these too? No. Oh, we'll do it. Well, the chicken house really needs to be next to the bird. In the barn, next to the barn. I guess we already done that. We got that. Yeah. 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 I was thinking though that the chickens might like to go out to the art orchard to visit though. Yeah. 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 Oh, we got the deck, maybe the veggie garden. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Here we can pass. Oh, there we go. Nice, detox. Yeah, somebody needs to be the kitchen. Joey, you should be the kitchen. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. 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 After things are harvested, we can bring the ducks in to, to forage in there. For sure. Yeah. I've never owned ducks. Yeah. Yeah. They're messy. They're messy. The ducks actually. Need to go to the orchard too. Yes, that's what I was thinking. Yeah, and then maybe they're going to come back and winter over in the pot in the barn. Yes. Yeah, because the ducks aren't as um, you said destructive, right? Uh, yes. Uh, yeah. Don't you want them to leave then? <laughs> 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 come by, come by, come back, fly away. away. Yeah. Yeah. Right over in the in, in the barn because the <laughs> pond shows <throws> up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, or they go to the freezer. <laughs> <laughs> Back to the pond. <laughs> well, somebody's got to take a photo of the herb garden. Go into the herb garden. You need to get somebody. Okay. You need to get people. <laughs> Again mimicking patterns that we see in nature. It's a web of connections. So in permaculture, it's not so much the quantity of elements that you have in your system that makes it resilient, it's the connections between them, the quantity of connections between them. And so what happens if the, say, you let go of one of your, the orchard lets go, right? It's still resilient, okay? Same with us, any, a spider web. Right? If one line lets go, if something doesn't work, right, in terms of adversity in the system, remember each function being supported by multiple elements, you're still resilient in your system. So this also... That garden spider's got to come back in and just fix that web. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Frank's like, give that back to me. Give me that connection. <laughs> Place all of the elements on your property and do just a quick brainstorm. Don't think too much about it. Don't analyze it like, oh, the trellis could be connected to the pond. You know, <laughs> think about those types of things. And what it shows you is, okay, things that need to be, are connected need to be close to one another, right? So the greenhouse and the pond maybe need to be close. The greenhouse and the veggie garden need to be close to one another. The herb garden and the veggie garden the chickens in the veggie garden. So relative, what it defines is the relative placement of where you want to put things on your map. 
And some of it might work, some of it may not, but this is a good starting point in terms of the more connections that you have between two elements, the closer you want them to be, because you don't want to make more work for yourself in terms of how you design your property. Or where you have to walk. Exactly. To or go to to exactly. To so making that connection as well, where you go out to the garden, you weed a little bit in the garden, you pass by the compost, or you pass by the chicken coop, you put those weeds in the chicken coop, you come back, you harvest something in your garden, you come indoors. So your, your trip out to the garden, you have multiple things that you're doing. You call it a perma trip. trip. Pardon me? A perma trip. Oh, I've never heard of that. <laughs> <laughs> if I'm going to town, I've got 10 things I'm going to do. Exactly. Because yeah. it's a 50 mile round trip if I'm going to do it. And I've got 10 things I'm going to do when I'm, I've done the day's work. I can come home and read the paper and yeah. shoot some arrows, you know. So yeah. Yeah. And that's about stacking functions. So we do that, you know, a lot of permaculture is common sense. We do that sometimes when we're in town. It's like, Oh, I gotta drop those books off the library, and then I'm gonna go to the grocery store, and then I'm gonna, you know, do some errands. You know, we stack the functions in one trip, so we're burning less fossil fuels and we're saving time. So you can do that in, you know, driving, but then you can also do it in a walk around your garden too, in terms of the different functions. You're gonna drop off the compost, you're gonna weed a little, you're gonna feed the chickens, you're gonna harvest that zucchini, and then you're gonna come inside. And so placing things where that makes sense and where it's convenient then makes for a better design and makes it more efficient. And, and if you're mindful about all of those functions and activities, then you, you, don't, have to, uh, you don't have to meditate. You're already yeah. there, right? So, so for those who you know, really want to be productive and are productive people in the world, this is great. Permaculture is great for that. <laughs> we can get all sorts of stuff accomplished. Yeah. All right, so let's, uh, where's the end of this? Isn't it by you? Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait, it's where it is. <laughs> okay, so we're going to, I don't know how we're going to do this. For a client, I'd send them a client questionnaire, asking them what their design goals are, how much time they have, what the budget is, blah, blah, blah. But what we really want to get from Cindy is what's her vision goals and maybe some of the elements that she has on our property. So I'll let you take it away and we're going to listen. Okay. So I, if, we were, if I was a client, I'd be a very bad client because this is all very abstract. Uh, and I'm not going to read everything to you. The first page of, of this is, is sort of our overall, Steve and I, what we came up with is our various philosophy um, and, and life um, plans, which is sort of our mission. So I'll read that and then I'm going to move to the second page. So resting in love, beauty, and harmony, we inquire, explore, and grow ourselves. Through this, we co-create co sanctuary, nurturing, and tranquility for ourselves and all we find here and those who find us. So and then I'll move on to the next page. I want to take just a second uh, and just bring us to place. So thousands of years ago, this was a glacial lake. And over time, the glaciers melted, and this became a massive river. And now we stand here in what is a floodplain and convergence of, of beautiful rivers and an underground river that then converged down into our Flathead River. We're blessed to be on this land. So this land was then settled by multiple Native Americans, tribes, who I'm ashamed that I don't even know their names. So that's part of my winter project to learn this. I know the Salish and the Kootenai were here, but I don't know when. Um, I know they left during lifetimes of friends of mine, or, or were, were basically thrown out. But this was entirely forested, is my understanding. This was was primeval um, um, conifer until probably a few generations ago. And then this was homesteaded by farmers. We know that this, I don't know who homesteaded this land, but this was built by the Robachers, who are still here. 
and the fourth generation uh, Robachers are, um, are, are, are Nahani's age. And she's very engaged and they have protected the adjacent land. So, and we're, we're blessed to have just walked onto the property and gone, something wonderful is calling, calling forth here. And ultimately it was like, what's the name of this place? This place is something beautiful. So there we are at something beautiful. Um, I've had a very hard, I'm a big thinker. And so I have a, I'm a big thinker and then I'm like, I have a great idea and it's like, okay, I'll do that detail. So hey, let's plow 100 acres. No, I didn't have 100 acres, but so let's put in a forest. Um, and so this is, this is my first go at trying to think about, it finally occurred to me that I have to look at myself and my husband and what are we doing and what do we want. And that's much smaller than what I can imagine happening on these lands. And so I put that here um, and the first three bullet points are things that we want to do up at Two Hoots for ourselves, grow our own food, focus on a vegan diet, how, um, power ourselves, care for our companion animals, um, and those sorts of things. And then everything else is going to be in collaboration with others. Is this going to need this? Will, and, I, and I'm open to allowing things to arise organically. When I just close my eyes and imagine what could happen on these lands, I see all of these various things. This area of the valley where I'm blessed and Amy owns land and we have friends here, we could grow food for this entire county on these lands and preserve ecosystem and preserve water and that sort of thing. I'm not saying we should, but we must have farmland. We must grow food here. We, we can't just build over all of it. Um, so, things that have come to my mind and it's like somewhere here we could have demonstration and trial gardens that show permaculture principles that show how you can grow land with animals cooperatively without eating them, ancient grains, all kinds of good stuff. I have a basis in science. I would love to support research, research um, collaborations, ways to do things in this new changing climate. Um, of course, there's room for, mar I don't know how many market gardens, community gardens, par partnerships with people who want to grow food. I have land. I'm one woman. I don't have enough labor. I love farm animals. A farm sanctuary could be moved could be somehow integrated. Uh, I don't know why there's always a commercial kitchen comes up every time I think about it, but it's like there needs to be a commercial kitchen somewhere here. I don't know why. Um, I like to fool with fiber, um, you know, so fiber processing. Um, and now we get down to what's sensible, developing infrastructure for com to comfortably hold retreats, multi-day classes, educational center for classes, and then the other thing I keep thinking about is small-scale seed processing because a barrier to growing, to collecting your own seeds, especially for things like grains and things that are fiddly, is ha having small-scale actual equipment that people, you can come and use. So a cooperative way of doing that. Um, and then the other thing is the whole, the whole culture of, of getting away from throwaway culture to fixing stuff, like fixing that chair rather than buying a new plastic one. Um, and so that's just kind of a bunch of wild stuff. The elements that I have here are really fairly, right now, are fairly fixed because we've spent a year mostly just watching this place and getting to know it. And quite frankly, I didn't have the time to do anything. And so the management's all been done by a fellow who's been doing it for several years. So I have the house, we have the landscape, we have a bunch of old farm equipment all out over there. Um, and the pond and the perennial flower gardens and probably some other things, access to the water. That's here. Up at the other place, which is where we primarily live, we have, I've got a lot more things in place. So we have our house um, and, and a lot of them are not coherently put together. What I really want to develop soon is, um, is a greenhouse. And so one of the big questions is where does the greenhouse go? So I've just moved to two hoots in case you, I, I wandered. Um, where does the greenhouse go? And I would like to create, have something that's very efficient that's like one greenhouse for this one woman as opposed to all these other things I've tried. So greenhouse, consolidate my garden sort of thing. How can that be done better than what I've got going on right now? Develop the food forest, um, care for my animals, you know, chicken coop things that need to go on. How can we, how, um, is there a place for a pond? And that's probably enough.
Great Barber, reforestation. I'll shut up. So those are my thoughts. So what I would love to have from you today is for you to think about what you're really interested in for your own site and then, you know, kind of work with that as it applies to my site. I'm, I'm looking for ideas and things that will fit my site, but mostly I want, I want this to go on out into the community and pay it forward for your site, for your friends, for people you meet. And that's the biggest gift I get. Do you have questions for me? Yes? I have a big question. <laughs> Amy, you don't ever have small questions. I love you for that. She's a bigger thinker than I am. <laughs> well, the big question is um, you, you recognize um, that it was forested and you know how valuable this is for wildlife and how valuable it could be, but then you also recognize the importance of our, our farming heritage and we have the best farmland. So a really big question, and it's probably putting on the spot, is are you envisioning restoring things to wildlife and having and, and minimizing your farmland? Are you thinking that kind of how it is is really what you see. You're going to keep the farmland, maybe you'll increase some of the wildlife buffers, or are you seeing a big wildlife restoration? But and then you will have wildlife conflicts. That's one thing. Right, absolutely. This is a sink for grizzly bears. Right. So if you're thinking, I'm going to do all this wildlife, I want to reforest everything, you have to think about how comfortable you're going to be because it will be packed right. with wildlife. Right, exactly. And I don't actually have a plan for that. Um, I, I'll tell you what my underlying feeling about it is, is yes and no. In that what we need to do, learn to do in society is to, 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 to consider everyone, and everyone includes the trees, the bears, the ducks, the, the, that sort of thing. So we need to be able to grow food. We need to be able to live um, comfortably and sensibly and at the same time share our space. So I don't see restoring it 100% to, to the way it was, because the way it was is over, really. I mean, the climate's changing. We could plant it the way it was 300 years ago, and it wouldn't survive. So that was a, but that's, but that's a huge piece to go, if we encourage more, we're going to have grizzly. And so if we're going to have grizzly, what are we going to do? And how do we locate stuff? So what we've found is that, so far, because of the way it is, we don't have the bears come up to two hoots, but they definitely are here. Be and we don't have a, a veg strip yet. So, so that was a wild, how was that? And do they, they don't come to they, the Oh, they would. they would. Oh yeah, if they're hungry enough and there's something really good on this side, but they'll come right through. So you have to have high powered, well her husband's the grizzly expert, so to keep them out, you really don't keep them out. No, you just, you, you, you electrify. The, um, the main attractants, like a beehive would be really big. Right, right. You know, and you would probably electrify that. Right. But I think you'd want a, a big open buffer. Yeah. So, but like we have. Yeah. yeah, we have a big open buffer right now, and so you wouldn't want to reconnect that. Yeah. Yeah, so that is just something to keep in mind in terms of the design of the site. Right. The grizzly pressure is here on this site as opposed to maybe up at two hoots. And we can create it up there really easily by creating more corridor that goes to two hoots, right. and we might not want to. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, Frank? Yeah, it is a big question. <laughs> you can come up here, Curry. Yeah. And it's personal. <laughs> <laughs> Speak real loud so it's for Michael. Okay. Um, well, we're 57 years old, and so I, and I'm a, you know, we're pragmatic type people anyway, so I'm thinking more all the time of, uh, you know, succession planning, right. that type of thing. For, and, and you made the statement the other day, which I couldn't agree more, that basically you've got to take care of yourself first. Right. And, 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 and I feel that we, and I'm sure you do too, that, that you know, we are the most benefit to society and, and the community when we're whole ourselves and we're grounded, etc. Absolutely. So with that in mind, uh, it feels like if I was in your shoes, I would feel torn between the two places, mm -hmm. and and that um, so I'm 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 curious. And I guess I'm asking for more input as to if you envision um, developing or how how to balance that both places, or would you? 
I think if it was me, I would probably be developing a plan to, you know, consolidate here. Mm -hmm. You know, whether it be, you know, build another house or whatever, but so that I wasn't torn. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think of it as like reading two books at once, though. Like you can sit there and decide which book to pick up and read, or you can like right. be reading two books at once and just go back and forth steadily, like, you know, you're not... But you're young. Right. I Unrealistic for there to be a succession plan for like even if it wasn't like obvious in this moment like if you start a, if you build a commercial kitchen it's not going to get torn down it's going to get used in the future right so something like that I think is maybe better than the biggest food force possible because a community kitchen is going to keep people coming back and gardening and adding to it but if you build a huge forest the grizzlies are going to go up there kind of thing right so I think uh, yeah that's like a good consideration but maybe it could be like just twist the motives for things that aren't going to get bulldozed if you, you know, want to like, the succession plan is maybe not your exact dream, but like something beautifully organic will come out of it either way. Right. And so I like that. Yeah. Thank you. Well, and, and you bring up something, well, there, there are several aspects to it, but there's a real, we have a real problem right now in our, in our society of how do we, I mean, Jerome is facing this, he's built this incredible thing, and it's still a piece of property. You know, and so like somebody's, it happened with the food forest guy in England, that fellow died and his heirs all fought over it. How, we don't have a mechanism. I keep thinking, how do I protect this land in a way, there are conservation easements and those are great, but it's still commercial. Then I'm basically just saying, you know what, now you own my conservation value. And I, that's what I will do if I die next night, die tomorrow. But how, do, how does one create a situation where the land is protected? So we plant a forest, and those trees, every tree you plant is going to outlive me. And I care about that, because those trees are also sentient. And so I care about that. And so how do we, how do we protect that? How do we protect what we build on this land, not to make me look good, but for this community and for the entire community, the entire ecosystem? I don't have an answer for that. Um, but, you know, so I'm exploring like rights of nature, can I put that in my will? Um, this is just kind of an all leading edge but sort of thing. what I was getting at too is the in between, not, not to, to... Before, yeah. So yeah. What do, where do I focus my energies? Yeah, is what's what, best for you, you know, right. in And so what we ended up, what we, what we've, and we've had this conversation because this is a more accessible house, but I have a special needs 14 year old and this house is way too small for him. So, um, so we have to focus at least for the next decade on living there, on that property and that, that, that work. And so we're really focusing uh, with Steve and others, Steve um, Berglund, on trying to, create, to decrease our footprint, trying to make that place very comfortable for us inside and also very comfortable for me outside as I grow my food and that sort of thing. So the things I'm going to do personally are going to be up there. Okay. Um, the things we might do otherwise is to some extent going to be de depend on who I meet and how we can build relationships to have this area be, a, this land be of service to me, to, to you, to the community. And I don't have an answer for that because I don't have a big web, web of connection. I have a much bigger one today than I had yesterday or that I had three days ago. So does that help? Yeah, I guess what I'm hearing is, is your... Um you're comfortable and you're, you're heading in the direction where you probably would never move here, but you want to secure, protect, and enjoy this, this location. Mm -hmm. you, you're not feeling torn between the two places. I'm not feeling torn between the two places except for when people are like, why don't you rent it out? And it's like, because I want to go sit on that dock. <laughs> and that's exactly, I don't have to, and I want to sit on that dock. Yeah. And so that's the whole reason. Sure. So I don't feel, I need to, but I, no, I don't, I don't feel torn. And, and so at this point, the best place for us as a family and as a couple is definitely up there. This is a much smaller scale house. So this is an ongoing thing. That, that, and there are really great questions. I'm not attached to, to one thing or the other. Obviously, I need a home. Steve and I are very quiet people. I am a very energized person when I'm with people who care about 
care about the earth and care about these sorts of things. But I'm a very quiet person. Where, so as far as sharing my life space with 20 people, I'm not going to be doing that. But to, to create spaces like this is awesome. Did that make sense? Yes. OK. So different fashion. Right. In 10 or 15 years, we can, we can look back and go, well, we did the best we could, but yeah, exactly. now, we got, now we need to move. It. I think, OK, I, that really helps me. Yeah, so if we were going to have a, a, a seed equipment cooperative, it would be here. Yeah. If we were going to, and your personal greenhouse would be there. My personal greenhouse would be over there. But if we wanted rolling thunder or hoop houses for people to grow, they'd be out there. Yeah, the idea of having an experimental grain field there, right? All kinds of uh, CSA farming that could be there, right? A beautiful alfalfa field, right? Exactly. CSA. Community for the agriculture. What we want to do is have one, two groups of four, and one group of three. Okay, that's how we're going to divide ourselves up. One group of four is going to work on the two hoots property, and the other two groups are going to work on this property. So if there are some people who are really interested in more of the kind of private, you know, space, two hoots area, how do we make that area up there a place where Steve and Cindy and their son grow much of their own food, they power themselves regeneratively, they care for their companion animals, they have a climate battery greenhouse, all of that. If you're compelled to do that, then, then get into that group. If you're more compelled and have ideas and have been thinking all this weekend about this space and how this can be used, maybe it's a commercial kitchen, maybe it's a retreat center, then um, work on that group. Okay. Can I just add something too, as a wildlife biologist? Um, <laughs> I, 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 I'm thinking Cindy in her answer wasn't saying she's not interested in wildlife restoration. I think she, I think the question is she doesn't want to restore it all. But I do think this is a really, really valuable wildlife area, mm -hmm. and I'm just hoping that we think about that in yeah. terms of um, the the traffic, what we're going to, you know, to commercialize this whole. Area, I think we just have to be sensitive. I think there's a lot of riparian wildlife things we, we can do. Wildlife things and still keep open. So uh, to me, it's just uh, just it's a really important wildlife. Yes. Yes. Absolutely, and and to me that trumps what we do with people. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. Well, you've already explored that and been developing that over on the other side. Right. Uh, so there is uh, um, somehow this field also the wildlife is coming from here to here. How do we? Also, make a corridor from this field over to there. So of course, there's another property that we don't we don't own right here, so that's a difficult thing. Well, I think the riparian. I think they'll just follow the riparian zone. Yeah. If we do He's already done there. quite a bit of stuff over there that uh, in the outlying areas around there that they're not using. So right. To put them into uh, pollinator gardens, etc. So mm -hmm. that's already in, in the process. Right, and I guess I'll add that I see that the experimental, like the, the experimental um, fields for um, alley cropping and stuff like that, um, I still would see that happening up in my old market garden. So that's still my private space, sort of, but that seems like something that could be done, and I'm not opposed to that. So I know that's kind of, to me, that makes total sense because I own both properties, but um, so there you go. Okay, so I think what we're going to do is, so here's the scene. There are the big overall maps of the property, and then there is a close-up of the property, a close of the property. So each group will get a big map and a close-up. This is what we want. What do you think that you should do? And also, if you can put some stuff on paper, it doesn't have to be perfect, right? We're not here to create oh. some amazing, beautiful permaculture design, but we have markers, we have shapes that you can use if you want to put in trees, we have all of those things that you can use to represent your idea on paper. And what you can do is just take a piece of tracing paper and you're just drawing stuff over top. Lay this on here, you can't see this actually very well, you can put it on a window and you can see it better. And then you can trace over top and say, oh, we're going to put more alley cropping or a food forest in this area. We're going to, you know, do your annual kitchen garden here. Or in the case of this property, we're going to put maybe a yurt or a couple additional cabins in this area. Or we're going to develop more. We're going to plant a bunch of trees. 
um, for, for wildlife restoration. Does that make sense? Or what I want, yeah. <laughs> Do right. I have this, this place? Yeah. Should we put this on the Sure. To like have your riparian forest like <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then we're thinking that you need to have a chemical like right. yeah. this is yeah. all yours, yeah. right? Yeah. This is all gonna be farm. Yeah. 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 No, no, it's not a compost toilet. I'm gonna have a compost toilet. And I thought about possibly utilizing roof water. And then I think also with the sh with the barn, if you, if you got that water away and you're catching it, and, and you're redirecting the water coming off of here, and then maybe a little bit of floor elevation. So duckweed and the fertilizer, uh, it'd be a good place for the ducks, and then maybe the. Uh, so we're trying to understand um, the topography of this property to to Coots Island. To, and trying to find a location for a greenhouse and concerned about water issues around this barn behind us. Um, and we've come to a conclusion that there's a good location for a greenhouse here to my left and that we can deal with the water mitigation. That's the water issues that are coming off of the barn behind us, the roofs, the slopes, and the house. So this location, uh, we're concerned about the heating system for the house. There's geothermal loops that run from the house and the garage to my right through this area. So we would need to determine uh, at some point if, if those need, need to be moved or if it's feasible to move those and then locating those. What you're saying is that we need to we need to identify where the geothermal is before we can decide whether or not we can put the greenhouse here. So I think that's probably a good determination, yeah. Okay. Yep. This was a market farm. They sold it through CSAs, and they're not doing that anymore. So the task is to find out what to do with this land. The water, the deer, the bears, maybe... They do some planting, some choke cherry plantings, or something to keep the bears over there. Feed the bears, but keep them over there. <laughs> the beauty of doing a design process like this is that principle of use and value diversity, right? There are so many, so many of you come and have your own experience and your own ideas, and trying to bring that together and come to consensus on that is a process, mm -hmm. but also the opportunity. You know, it's one if me, Jerome, and Cindy think about the site, but it's another to bring a whole group of other people into that design. And so that's what I love about the design process itself, is just this opportunity to um, come together and bring all of those ideas and offer ideas that I have never thought about for this site or Cindy has never thought about, about for this site. So, um, well, we, found, we found new ideas um, for the other site that we, that we hadn't seen the last time. Yeah, so good. And that's part, partly also, you know, Steve, you having s spent some time on that site too, you know, the more time you spend on the site too, the more the design evolves. So, yeah, Amy, do, do you want to go ahead and, because of this um, major, um, scale and unknowns. Like, yeah. Is there going to be a caretaker? Is there not? It sure is everything if there will be or there won't be. Is there, uh, you know, so we we um, ended up having, um, I think, respecting each other's opinions, but also having total opposite opinions. Like, where yeah. we couldn't even uh, work together because, you know, like, for instance, is it an RV? Do RV stay here or is it a cabin? Yeah. Is it a commercial kitchen where everyone yeah. comes or is it a retreat? So, um, 
So we ended up breaking into two groups mm -hmm. just because Randy and I uh, were definitely more keyed into the nature yep. part of it because we were both weather well yeah. folks. So that's where we are coming from. You're coming from a kind of a minimal, there's no caretaker here. If there was a caretaker, of course, everything could be more intense. That's great. And so as a group, you kind of self-organized and cleaved off. So one thing about this whole process is we're going to bring it back to the social systems design. In some design charrettes, the instructors will design the teams. They will spend you know, the first few days working with everybody, look at people's strengths, and then actually specifically and intentionally design the teams based on the, the strengths that people bring to the table. It might be strengths in terms of actual violence, in terms of wildlife biology, or plant systems, or whatever, but it also might be strengths also in terms of follow through, in terms of organization, any of that kind of stuff. So there are so many layers to this permaculture piece, and that's there are conflicts within groups. You know, we've all done group work before, not just in the permaculture design context, we've done it in, uh, you know, in high school or whatever, and you know, there are always the people that are like, okay, let's get this done, and there are always the people that are, you're going to go, I'm going to go have a smoke, they ride off the coattails of other people, or, or they just bring the ideas, but they can't distill it together, so that's some, that's something to be very conscious of. You know, we are different people and we work in different ways and part of community building and part of social systems design is how can we all get along and how can we build strategies within ourselves to go through the hard times, right? It's back to the inner landscape. You know, if we're going to build this community, people are going to trigger us, right? That's inevitable, you know? It's hard enough to have a husband or a partner or a spouse, you know, to think about working with five people. That gets even more. Um, that that gets even more contentious. So I think that's something just to be conscious of. That's why we. That's why I brought up social systems design in the first evening. But it's like we do want. Like we have this whole thing of oh, this is such a great community and and it's great. But then you know things get hard. And, um, and I think to stick through that to a better place. And I have to say that I've, you know, we've done permaculture design courses before, we've done design charrettes before, and there's conflict always happens, you know? And some people work together, some people don't work well together, but that's just human nature. I don't have to tell anybody that. Um, but it's whether or not we can stick through that and then work through it and come out the other side um, better and more whole. So yeah, New Honey, you want to just yeah, yeah, I share that. that. Oh, yeah, I was out there. Um, I did this morning. I thought it was out there. Um, yeah, you know, I'm the kid here, and I'm still figuring out um, my place. Uh, transitions lately, so I appreciate all you guys and your perspectives, and like, you're, I appreciate that you are who you are, and like, you're, you know, I, I don't, I don't break it, but we all sort of like, uh, get hardened, but I don't think it's a bad thing, because it defines who we are, and we come up to those things, and it helps us question ourselves, and as a young person, I need that, and I love when people are the way they are. Um, even when that creates conflict, because it helps me question myself and become a better person. Yeah. So, um, yeah. In the gift of good land, Wendell Berry articulates this challenge at another level. Uh, addressing the problem of agriculture, but acknowledging the universal dilemma at the same time. The most necessary thing in agriculture is not to invent new technologies or methods, not to achieve breakthroughs, but to determine what tools and methods are appropriate to specific people, places, and needs, and to apply them correctly. Application, which the heroic approach ignores, is the crux. Because no two farms or farmers are alike, no two fields are alike, just the changing shape or topography of the land makes for differences of the most formidable kind. Abstractions never cross these boundaries without either ceasing to be abstractions or doing damage. The bigger and more expensive, the more heroic they are, the harder they are to apply considerately, 
and conserving them. So, yeah, no two people on farms are the same. And I love that, uh, you know, with the yarn, because it's always the connections. I'm in a systems thinking class right now, and it's about the relationships and the connections. And, like, you are who you are, and you change, but those connections, and they change, too. But you can always build bridges where there's a big, big river or whatever, you know, Panama Canal. It's like, y'all, so, okay, we're connecting two waterways. Frank. Just listening to this, it, it, it reminds me of uh, one of the challenges, I think, of uh, the family farms. You've seen a lot of family farms where, you know, the brothers were, they couldn't, you know, they were too diverse or whatever, or the, you know, the siblings or yep. whatever, that they couldn't keep it together. And, and so a lot of them went by the wayside just because of the relationship. You know. Yes. Or one of them left the farm and the other one stuck with yes. it. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Stuff like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, um, you know, I really admire when you see the situations when the family stuck together. You know, there's, uh, as an example, there's a business in Billings. There were, it's a body shop. I've been taking my stuff there for 30 years. But anyway, they're second generation and all three siblings, there's only three siblings, but all three siblings are still working there together and have been working, you know, they're pushing 70 years old, they've been working together since they were, wow. their whole lives, yeah. you know, and I'm like, wow, that's pretty amazing, you pull, you know, you're able to do that, because, you know, that's, um, that's really cool. Yeah, I think the, the, the theme that runs throughout this, whether you're working in groups, whether you're engaging in your own design process, whether you're, you know, whatever you're doing, whether you're building a farm, is that humility. It's like to step back and just, be humble in where you are and the place that you are and what you're trying to build and humble in the presence of letting go. Yes. I think Tick yes. on, tick on hard say deep listening. Deep listening. Uh, yeah. Yes. Nice. Yeah. Okay. Amy and I kind of hit it off because we're both wildlife biologists and, um, and I've wrestled this whole weekend with the, with the concept does land have to be productive from a human standpoint versus the natural one. My focus is, and our focus is very much on the natural systems and wildlife corridors are really important because they're all have been disconnected and we need wildlife corridors so we kind of focused on that a bit but we went back we went around outside we identified our zones zone one and the zone two and the zone at least out to the zone four and five and um and looked at the sun sectors and so uh sunlight and it seemed like the greenhouse and gardening we have to be out there because that's where the sun is um and um, there is an existing pond out here with some fruit trees. You could have a, a food forest. Uh, minimal. And we kind of took a minimalist approach, um, keep everything as, as much as it is now. Um, but you could have a little food forest out there as well. And veggie garden out over here on this side of the house. So the house is right here. And uh, the tool shed in there, there's the garage. Uh, used as a tool shed. Um, you could capture the water off the house. There's a natural uh, slope going down towards the existing pond and capture some of that water um, and hold it, sink it, and then move it down towards the, the pond. Um, and then the back side of the house back here would be more as it is now, um, kind of an area for, for guests when you have retreats. Um, you can go out there and hang out, you can have a classroom out there, outdoor classroom, um, just a place to go outside and meditate. Um, educational area, you have access to the water. Um, and so, um, what else do we have in there? I think that kind of mostly covers that area, so your zone one and two, and you would fence that off, and we thought about moving the road, um, and so, um, kind of inside that fence and keeping it right in there close 
to the house and and then make this a wildlife corridor and you could also have some uh, agricultural out here, some row cropping or whatever, um, but try to move the wildlife from that nature, their, um, nature conservancy area, is that nature conservancy land, um, the row markers, and so that's all natural forest over there, move the wildlife out here away from the house, because it's such a narrow corridor back there. We didn't want conflict, so you could plant some uh, native plants out here, put the pond out there in the low area, um, dig it deeper and put a pond, maybe put some willows and some aspen, and um, you could have a wildlife viewing area as well. People could see wildlife travel through there. Um, and, then, and then broaden the riparian area over here um, for wildlife corridors, so move them this way um, and keep this fenced. Um, to keep the wildlife, especially the bears, out of that area. Um, and then maybe some walking areas, walking paths through the wildlife repairing area over here, um, but away from the river's edge or the edge of the slough, but a couple of access points down in there. So this would be edge. Um, and, but you didn't want to get too close to this house over here. I don't want them to think, oh, you're sending all the wildlife over to our house. <laughs> so try to kind of just have a narrow strip in here where they would have a little bit of cover. Um, it's natural. And some native plants, um, your pollinator gardens, you know, your pollinator, pollinator plants, um, your bees would be out there, perhaps. Um, so anything to add, Amy? I'm sure. that, that, that would be a question for you, how comfortable you are with um, uh, whether you wanted some open space and then they, they, will, they, will, they will go to whatever shrubbery or cover you put out there. So you have to kind of think about how close you want the wildlife. I think the priority is taking that riparian um, zone and moving it inland. Is, yeah, that's, so that's a real, a real um, yeah. cool thing to do, we think. And then the other thing was interesting, I talked to our wonderful chefs, the ladies, mm -hmm. and they have some ideas about just the, um, I'll, I'll share, um, that I thought were really smart. They talked about having um, a wall, so um, they had to take the food processor out, but it's, it, it's noisy, and they're very conscious of this being a conference room, and so they recommended that you possibly follow the flooring and somehow design where there's... You, they you have more quiet and possibly another entrance here to keep the the kitchen a little separate. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was cool. cool. That was neat. And then let's see. We had um, we wrote little notes here. Mm -hmm. um, what else is there? What's floating out in the slew there? No. Oh, that was the kitchen. Talk about kitchen oh, okay. ideas. Gotcha. Um, oh, sorry, kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> Made from plastic awesome. bottles. <laughs> um, again, I think the question is um, a big one: is is um, whether you do want someone to live here and manage it, and then of course you. Have, and we were thinking that um, you want to have examples, even if you aren't here, and if this is going to be um, a permaculture education center, you will still want to have things to show it, but on a much lower level, so, you, so you're not overwhelmed by all the bounty it's producing. Right. Well, then I, I really appreciate the two of your perspectives, because we, you know, this area definitely gets the really heavy wildlife pressure, and I, I respect that, and I love that about it. And so how can, so creating, a, you know, something out in that field where they already, I mean, the deer bed down back in there, there's turkey, the porcupine, I've seen porcupines back there. Mm -hmm. So how can we create that so it's supportive and we encourage the wildlife to move where they won't get in trouble um, interacting, you know, in, with humans. And then as we think sensibly about what do we plant here, because whatever it is, the bears and, and the, the um, deer are going to eat it unless it's protected intensively. So I really appreciate this whole... We forgot to mention, you know, I think it's obvious, we think that you need to have some type of um, chemical buffer on the edge of the field. So I think you were talking about perhaps the pond would be something that if you just dig um, test holes that the water is so close to the surface, they probably would just show up. 
is what I thought I heard you they could <coughs> potentially, or you move the water across the land in the spring and the snow would be a fun situation. Yeah. Depending on how far away that sway that, that area is, you've got that artesian water that's dumping mm -hmm. right now in, back into the right. slough. Different Why couldn't that artesian around. water be directed towards a low area and you'd have all the water you ever needed? Right. Well, we don't have the water right to the water that's going in the slough. Oh. Um, and, um, okay. and so that was created back when they did wells this way. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's not even legal to do anymore. But when I talked, so, so, um, so yeah, I mean, obviously thinking through it, it's like, yeah, why is that water going in the slough when it should go somewhere else? Um, but legally, we probably have some struggles there. What if you just have it, uh, or possibly legally, you can get over the hump is you're not consuming any of that water. It goes into the pond first, and then it spills out of the pond back into the slough. Yeah, yeah. Just redirect There you go. Yeah, that would be, and then, and then you wouldn't have to talk about it if anybody says about its own. Um, yeah, you just redirect the water and then the slough, and then it would be the same thing. Exactly. Perfect. And I'm, I just want to say, I'm realizing what you guys did, that we planned a lot of stuff here. And I'm not sure that we planned enough of a cor wildlife corridor. I think we but were maybe considering not having the animals come up into the field like you were, but I like that it's such a different perspective. Like That's it really gives, yeah, yeah, exactly. I'm glad, like, um, but. Yeah, so we just where figured to start. We did want to work on the wildlife corridor, so we felt the same thing about the riparian. That was like a really similarity. We could start with similarities. We did think about a pond, but we were looking at this low area, which is like a little flood zone. Um, as a consideration, I mean, honestly, this would work great too. We discussed, um, so this food forest is, this is like the close, obviously, this is, um, there's already like a little fenced in area there. It's, uh, it's on quite a hill, so you could do some swales in it. And uh, even at the top, almost like one terrace, is like this one spot where it's steep. But they'd really just be like big swales, you know, lots of variation. Um, and then our other consideration is, um, where is it? It like right here and right here, there's sort of that, which I think is where they were thinking to put a pond, because it's a low area and it's green. Well, we were thinking you could start with your food forest in the fence, you could plant some outside that like you don't mind if the wildlife eat them until they get big and you could expand the food forest down that sort of like small little corridor that is what um, almost riparian because it's so moist and you could have a lot of variation there um yeah so i think we were we were thinking of that if it was a retreat place we didn't know how big or small you wanted to go with retreat. The other question was somebody living on the grounds to take care of whatever's going on here, whatever we decide, you decide to put here. Um, and so I think we created this with um, the thought in mind that there is going to be some groundskeepers mm -hmm. at some Maybe point. Groundskeeper. Groundskeeper. <laughs> <laughs> the retreat. Um, Vineyard, there's, I guess there's already grapes. Who put this? Anyway, we thought there was vineyard. Um, yeah. Well, yeah. We just along the fence. Along the fence. Along the fence. Mm -hmm. yeah. We yeah. wanted, to, if people came for um, camping, we created two camping areas. In case we were thinking an RV area, so they wouldn't have far to drive. They could camp. Mm -hmm. They could camp, then there's not a lot of cars on going through here. Yeah. Um, you can even just make a little parking lot area there too, like even if it, you know, to start and right. then turn into like just a way so that you don't have people coming all the way up into here with all their vehicles all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and then some yurts for people who want to um, do more community camping and not car camping. Um, you had mentioned a food for it, or uh, ancient grains. Mm -hmm. um, there's, I love einkorn. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. It's amazing, and I think because it, wheat grows here, right? Yeah. So we were thinking to have all of this area to be um, ancient grains. You mentioned sheep, so created a trail to two roots and sheep in here. I, I had a thought with the terrace with the sheep thing. Like if you were expanding this a lot, you might not want to put them right next to the wildlife corridor, maybe more out here, so that 
they're more, you know, an animal might go best with them, but when they find out it's not worth it, it's not worth it because there's no trees around. So that was my change in idea, but um, I was talking to you about the potential for a trail between the two, um, and so that sort of inspired the sheep because they are far out, but um, I mean, you would need someone attending to them, but theoretically you could still attend to them if someone wasn't around. You could also have them over on your land and maybe this trail would be a place where you could bring them over. This could be their like, summer or something like that. You know, summer you have someone living here and you bring the sheep over, but in the winter you bring them over by the llamas to like keep everything cozy, protect them from the animals. Um, Why don't you talk about that valley? Oh the yeah, place? so you're thinking like around the, this would be a little bit like midway um, as having some alley cropping like in these first few it would be a nice like front presentation and you could do some annual beds in between um, alley cropping obviously so then that's a nice box of like some annuals but you'd also get a little bit of the food forest going with some trees and I think presentation is really important right. like from your neighbor's perspective we talked about putting some trees here because this will overwhelm them you know um, but at the same time maybe just like a thin scape of trees out here in front of their house in between the houses and then to have the the grains be sort of supported by that, or they'd be protected. I don't know what they do with their fields. I, I know it's you're in here right now. It is, and are they using pesticides or anything that you, yeah, so the trees would be good for that because you really don't want your corn to get anything, so that would be a progression for sure. Uh, we talked about composting toilets. Um, it's low land, so another option for composting toilets is like what we do at festivals where it's all it's like in a plastic container and you process it. Like you don't need to do it right in the ground right there. You can take it and collect it and process it somewhere else. We just found all the technical designs for the Perfect. For the sunny job composting toilet. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of lot of research right now in music festivals. We're trying to get rid of composting toilet or we're trying to bring composting toilets instead of the porta potties because the porta potties are disgusting. They don't support it and the people making these laws. Well, we have ours for twenty five years and then design is Exactly. Yeah. Well, yeah. But uh, we are. It's, on, 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 on it's apparently illegal yeah. that composting yeah. toilets in Montana. Um, so for that uh, was something that was passed around. So we're not sure about if you want this to be a retreat center in a public space. So we have to go through the same process that you would for um, sanitation mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. that you would if you were putting in a septic tank. Yeah. Yeah. But there's a lot of regulations that are being passed that are in correspondence with composting toilets right now, like these people who are doing the festival thing, because the people who made those laws saying, uh, you know, uh, porta potties are perfect, 10 people for this many hours, it's not working out. They're getting overused, it's not working. And so in this situation, you could tap in on that and find those documents that are proving that they're sanitary and bring it in. And so this is actually potential for legalizing composting toilets in, in Montana. Like, you know, yeah, something no like that. Out there, so yeah, exactly. Well, they were approved in for Collins. Mm -hmm. If you had a septic system, you could put one of these Sunny Johns in. John got it passed in Fort Collins, so there's a precedence there. Yeah, We've had ours for 20 We just had the Pitkin County people come and look at our toilet because they want to build one in one of the farms that they're, uh, that they're helping put some infrastructure on. From the open space farms that are leasing to young farmers need a composting toilet. And they come to us to see that our, that ours has been there and I was looking through our files and found all of the designs that we are, and now they're on a PDF. So they're accessible now. My, my partner has them on PDF. I just recently listened to a blog, a blog that was pooped. It was pretty good. <laughs> this guy actually gave, just finished his PhD on composting toilets. Awesome. And he studied all the composting toilets on the market. and. Um, and all the ones that the different park services were using and stuff, and found out they really aren't working. They really, and what he found out is you have to separate the urine from the poop, and it's really difficult to do. So he finally designed. He actually came up with a design that does it. Uses a conveyor belt. Plus, it has to be age. Uh, you know, the age of the person using it is going to make a difference in terms of trying to make that separation. And so he actually designed a, a toilet that works to separate the two because if you have the urine and the They've been around for a while. So you can, in, in Latin America, all you need to do is you have a little compartment right there. But what we do is 
we make sure that the men don't pee in a composting toilet. They just pee on a tree somewhere. The women can pee in the composting toilet, and it doesn't overflow, it doesn't get too much urine in it, because too much urine makes it acid and smell. But just the right amount of urine is fine, providing you're putting enough uh, sawdust every time you use it. So there's, it's all... Yeah, but if it's in the back, he was doing more for backcountry stuff, a lot of for the park service and... Um, yeah, they can't they found that, the you figure out He designed yeah. one that separates for women, too, uh, so that cool. it, it's What's the name of the guy? Main is free. I could probably go back and find a yeah. blog. It's Maybe on a, it's on a, I, it's on a, a uh, like, uh, uh, podcast. Land in Mexico. Yeah. Yeah. Do you remember the composting toilet at Patricia's Land in Mexico? It has like a little collector in the yeah. front. It works fine. Yeah. It collects for girls and boys pee outside and I still pee outside. That's tropical though. That's yeah. tropical. Yeah. No, but you can use the little collector. Yeah, the little like collector. The they, front. they actually yeah. cast, it, cast it right there so you can pee right into it and then... Yeah. So then yeah. those are pretty... I'm sure that's where he got his ideas. He probably made like a modern one that works for us. We'd love to see what he's done though. So Do you know what that's called? I'd love to like, listen to it on my drive home. Uh, it was months ago. I'll have to look it up. It's a poop podcast. Yeah. So yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. 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 I like that. <laughs> 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 well, if he has a PhD on that, yeah. I'll find it. Well, yeah. maybe you can share that when we kind of send out an right. email with the right. follow-up. Is right. there right. anything so else about one, one last thing that we have is you mentioned grain processing. And we did put that on here over by the yards and like the tool shed. We thought that was a really cool concept. There is already that uh, grain processing looking right. thing. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, we need a little improvement. Storage bin. Yeah. yeah. We have an outdoor shower here, mm -hmm. close enough to the yurts, and the gray water from that could go into the food forest. Mm -hmm. Great. I think the last thing is just the herb garden. We thought it'd be cool now. Near the house, and the make it bigger. An outdoor, outdoor kitchen. kitchen, yeah. So we we moved the outdoor kitchen out a lot, around a lot. We decided like reasonably close to the house and close to the herb garden was definitely good. And a big thing we decided on because we thought about putting the outdoor kitchen in like back here behind the house, but we thought that like and I especially really think that kitchens are community spaces and. So then the idea was brought to put a fire near that, which I think is good because then it's like this community space and this whole field can like, I mean, not you're going to have hundreds of people, but you can have space for people, you can have a fire, you can have people cooking, and it's like this where we're close to them, but they can have their space and we can wander off. I think a fire would be nice. Center. A sauna. And a yeah, sauna. We can have a sauna yeah. because we want to come in. Oh, to the <laughs> Have a chicken tractor over here and bring your chickens right. over from over there and just like mow with your chicken. chicken. <laughs> 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 and it could be part of the education of right. Yeah, right, right. Or rabbit tractor chickens are great. Yeah. But yeah, remember everything? It looks so busy. So. But we, we, are, we, we also had dog park because we started off thinking that this area behind the house that's fenced. We're like, oh, what if you know the dogs Cameras. running around is too much and you want to contain them? Then we decided that would be a better little like herb garden. And we're like, oh, let's put it down here. Wait, they have dogs. But then we thought. They watch dogs, maybe you could coordinate with them, right? Have a gathering, be like, hey, do you guys want to make some money and watch these three dogs? And right. then they're right there. People can go visit their dogs. So and, and yes. that's what they do. Exactly. Yes. So they do dog day It's networking so with your neighbor. Give us a discount. Cool. Exactly. 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 Not <laughs> bad for a pumpkin. <laughs> <laughs> so let's just briefly talk. Let's go to the big, the the, the big picture, and you know, extending and enhancing that that wildlife corridor, that riparian area, and then there's a gap. This is fairly accurate. Although, when after this photo was taken, who knows when, there's more trees that are slowly filling in, but maybe enhance that. Mm -hmm. and, and that gives the wildlife a little bit of a corridor to travel through to the repairing area and, and down along the slough. But also, with the, the bear situation, Maybe you you plant some choke cherries out in that riparian area, or I don't know if that's realistic as a wildlife biologist. 
you know if anybody else has any comments on that. But uh, service berries, I don't know if service berries will grow at this elevation. Mm -hmm. They should. Yeah. So maybe you concentrate some foods for the bears. It, you know, we're, we're trying to share the, right. the, the land. Right. And that'll keep them over there, perhaps, yeah. when, they're, when they're down here. This, you know, this is a time of year when, they, when they're here. I don't know how long they're here. Yeah, They've got to go in den at some point when the food resources are gone. They're going to, oh, they got to get up. They have to go. Right. Unless there's, yeah. So, you know, we, we had talked about that. And then I'm just going to kind of move this direction. Frank, do you guys just kind of add any comments if, if I'm missing? And I'm sure I will. Um, so this corridor, right, this boundary, and this boundary is kind of wide open next to these cut alfalfa fields, and there's chemical usage there. So we, we want to try and at least pick up drift in a windy situation or on, you know, maybe not so much this boundary, but the long-range plans, I would say, try and separate the two with uh, Jerome, you're saying the 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 P, the Russian P, or the the Karagana and whatnot, fast growing, and it's there's a couple out there already. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And and that helps with the wildlife, the hummingbirds, and other things. Um, it's also the prevailing wind direction. Mm -hmm. So when when the wind is high, it comes right through. Where, that's why we put that first group of trees up. So you're right. Yeah, dense and making that more dense will also right. help. Yeah. That, yeah, will also help control that. When we get high winds, it comes out right through there. So your your future egg area, where your old market. Right. You know, we 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 walked through there and, and looked at that. And there's existing ras there's still ra remnant raspberry patches, and there's asparagus all over that area, which is pretty cool. Yeah. And you already have the irrigation system right. in there. Mm -hmm. Amazing irrigation potential there. The, is that a whole other well? Uh, it's another water right. We have 120, 120 gallons per minute off of our well, our artesian well, and so we have a second water right to use the water. So it looks like that's a whole nother well. It's actually just moved, it's brought in from the artesian. So okay. they, they dug it underground, that's when they hit that we found the septic. Okay. Was when they put that, wa that water line in. So when it's inside the, right it, next to the. Yeah. That's a, another well. No. It's just a. It's, it's just a booster. Pipe, it, it's it's piping. It's a boot. Yeah. It's 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 it's, it's piped pumped from the arterial well. Okay. And so then there's a booster, booster pump. Booster? Yeah. There's a booster pump. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So we thought that that water could possibly be used for another pond over there. Mm -hmm. um, in uh, the location that we identified, so it doesn't really show it on this map, but we know that. Behind the house, this this gets water. So there, this is kind of a low area and a swale that the topography kind of goes like that. Well, when it gets over here, there's a fence line right there that this area right here you can see is 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 someplace that. You could, you know, maybe put some hoop houses in there, or do what, what, what was your concept for that again? Just that's your old market area, right, market exactly. market farming area. Exactly. Well, we we could dual purpose that swale by actually creating a dam, a little dam there. Those are already swale there. Yeah, there's an existing drainage that actually it looks like it originally came clear from the river. It's like following and it goes through. all the way through. Yeah, so you pull that, so you, and naturally water is going to want to flow into that right. and behind the house and towards the barn. Right. We're trying to mitigate that situation with with water. 
Oh, I see. Without I having, I mean, in, in part. Well, that, that's part of the puzzle. Yeah. And it's a concept, mm -hmm. but it, it could work. So you create a pond right there, possibly, mm -hmm. just by doing a simple arch dam. Um, that stops the water flow into this swale, at least from this area. And maybe not a pond, but just a re retention, you yeah. know, a seasonal right. retention. Right. Yep, there you go. Right. Um, if you wanted to add another pond there, you possibly have this, the irrigation rights, and that water is so close, you could easily drip water into that fairly easily, I would think, and create another area yeah. if you want. Um, Why aren't we talking about the wetlands? Yeah. Yeah. The let's, wetlands that we get next to the pond. Or, or yeah, let's go. Lower right hand corner. Let's go in a little bit to, uh, so like Steve was saying, we're trying to yeah. mitigate this drainage and, and, and basically in all areas that we can. So uh, uh, the, the barn, you know, basically is in a low area and, you know, seasonally is having issues, you know. Um, so uh, one of the solutions is, is uh, you know, creating swales along the house here to capture, you know, that runoff that's coming into this um, uh, low area. I don't want to call that. I almost think of this more like a coulee, it's not quite big enough to be a coulee, but I don't want to confuse that swale with, you know, the kind of swales that, you know, that, uh, right, right. so, and swales underneath the solar panels to capture that water, and, and uh, uh, the uh, vineyard, or the vines, you know, right there at those swales, so, so capture that water, capture that's coming from the house off of these swales, redirect the rain gutters um, uh, into basically kind of bring this down to a wetlands area so you get you know all this water you know that does come through you know what's what you haven't captured gets down into the wetlands the snow breaks on the barn and guttered to redirect this down into kind of the wetlands and then the chicken coop can kind of integrate with this down here in the trees with the wetland and um, Hopefully that would, you know, mitigate this issue with the barn, and you wouldn't have to relocate the barn. Mm -hmm. um, In addition to, to that, we we would, you know, we would do some sort of a, a water transfer system in the soil, like a French, French drain. Oh right, yeah. Mm -hmm. sim similar to that. Mm -hmm. Um, so that could be successful, and right. the box stays where where it is. So What's the shadow behind it? That's, these are trees in here, and I think this is mostly shadow from the trees over here in this picture. Is yeah. what you're seeing. Oh, yeah, the shadow. You see the shadow of the barn. But you remember trees that close to the barn. There's tip right there where the wetlands are. Right, right. And it's, it's yeah, kind of a nice little Yeah, area. and we've had water collection here at that location where you put the wetlands before yeah. we had spring water. So I think what we're thinking with some, you know, with some... Um, contouring, yeah. Yeah, some contouring, the swales, and then some kind of French drain system to get this down in here. And then the other part is we were, um, it looks like you see the runs of your geothermal here, and we were looking at possibly greenhouse up, up here, but the, the disadvantage is it's a north-facing slope, you know, to, you're, you're trying to think, you know, have it close to the house, so, um, uh, Jerome, you know, pointed out that well, if we if we can keep it up in this area, if we keep it out of those um, geothermal <coughs> runs, you know, maybe that greenhouse and that has the south facing slope and it's still reasonably close to the house. So this might be a potential area for right. your, yeah. you know, for your uh, your greenhouse. Another concept we actually talked about too is, mm -hmm. I guess it's off your master bedroom. I mean, you probably wouldn't want to do this, but that could be just a small greenhouse off of your master bedroom. Off the east side. Off the east side, and you would still capture the south sun. You know, you get the east and the south as it's coming around. So that potentially maybe a small little, you know, greenhouse mm -hmm. right attached to the house off of your master bedroom. Uh, yeah. And maybe, you know, might take a little remodeling as far as, you know, your entrance or whatever. Yeah, remodeling going on anyway, so. Yeah, um, 
not to spoil your main view off the dining room, but you know, maybe the master bedroom, you know, you're looking out into this into the plants. Into the plants, you know, type of thing. You know, that's uh, was something yeah, that's we talked great. about. I like that. Um, and then down in here, uh, uh, a pond is a nice low area down in here where this water is coming. You know, you've got this kind of direct and coming in here, and just just kind of extend that a little bit and just uh, have have a uh, line a little pond down here to capture that water for your ducks and that type of thing. And then again, it's close to your gardening and, and that. So I don't know if I missed anything, but well, it's a natural depression right there, right past. The, that kind of riparian area where the well overspills. Right. And it's a perfect place and it's located you know, next to the orchard, the pond, to nutrient rich water to go back to the garden and the pond. Right. And you can have some seating around the pond. It's close to the house. Uh, it just felt really, you know. Awesome. Right. Well, and that would solve the, 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 the and situation. You have the around water there. Right, right. Because then you did the pond and mine it so that it would capture water yeah. as opposed to us having that overflow turned on which isn't necessary but it's necessary for the habitat right and so you could you could make that much more than i love that yeah and then another thing we talked about too is again for this this drainage thing because we you know seems like we should be able to mitigate that without having to move the barn you know if we just control you know the directions it's coming from but maybe some excavation in here so you have a, a depression for that water to run that way too, you know, so that you keep this, you know, yeah. off of the barn. So there, you know, um, you know, maybe a little excavation there. I was thinking maybe you might even want to move this fence in a little bit more, you know, uh, I don't know if you utilize this area, but you know, you can, if you're, if you're dealing with the drainage or whatever, this could be altered as needed. Oh yeah, the greenhouse, if it works on that location, would can actually be excavated into the hill. Exactly. Yeah. So it's you don't have as much exposed on the north side, kind of an earth berm right. effect. The geothermal lines, I wouldn't be afraid. We can deal with that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Good. Um, and you need uh, to be able the, to get the idea came up that you have a witcher. <laughs> Frank, yeah. you came up with that, yeah. Mm -hmm. Or Joe. Um, that can identify where those lines are. Mm -hmm. Just right. a water witcher. Yeah. Yeah, it's good. Yeah. And, uh, it looks like from it looks like they're more towards the solar panels, and they're not over on that side. Well, they actually do go the entire way. Go all the way. We know they do, and they actually go. We think all the way almost to this fence line. Wow. And we went back. Why were they so long? So there's yeah. a few of us that are a little confused. What GMO? Oh, it's our heating system. Oh, we have geothermal heating system, and it has this big loop field where it runs as antifreeze or something like that out through these. I think a lot of it's air, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's, or yeah. Yeah. Actually, glycol. these are fluid. This is these a fluid, fluid filled yeah. glycol. Glycol, yeah. 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 So they're basically... Solar panel? No. Yeah. So no, they're basically heat. picking up the, the heat of you down below frost cross line and stuff, yeah. and, and, and they take it through, I think, a converter probably at the house, but it basically you're, you're capturing mm -hmm. that heat from six feet down. Okay. <laughs> And, and turning it in, and bringing it into the house, and it goes through a uh, heat exchanger. Heat pump system, yeah. geothermal heat okay. pump. It's right. high they're, efficient. They're big loops in the ground. It's like a one inch to an inch and a quarter diameter pipe, and it just goes out in these trenches and comes back. Okay. So it's a loop that comes back. It goes out and collects the heat from the soil and brings it back to the unit. Okay. Isn't it very, you said it's efficient? It's, it's very one efficient. of the most efficient ways of Extremely way. efficient. If and it was put in correctly, no, which is not. not. <laughs> so, yeah, Cindy, you might, um, I was talking to Steve about that because we have a geothermal. Right. We have coils, and we did it in 1995, and it works fabulously. And he was saying, yours doesn't, so maybe part of the picture is, is um, Getting that fixed, correct? Right, exactly. That is one of the. Now we're gonna dig in there anyway. So yeah, because this one is also geothermal, but it seems to work. So. And if need be in in your in your elder years, you can just build a covered walkway over the greenhouse. Exactly. <laughs> Zip line. There you go. There you go. Little plow for my three my little chair. Um, enhance the mitigation between the properties right along this, this border where you've already started some right. plantings, but continue that. Yeah, it needs to be cancer. 
Did we forget anything, ladies? No, no, I think we covered it pretty well. Okay. Well, here we go. Wow. <laughs> this is it. <laughs> great job, everybody. I think that this is a great starting point um, for, you know, Jerome and Cindy have done some work around thinking through this, but this is just even more opportunity uh, to think through some of these issues. And I do, I was talking to, I forget who I was talking to out there, but this is a perfectly positioned place, both of these um, properties, just in terms of having retreats and permaculture design courses and workshops down here, while having the privacy of the Two Hoots area. Two Hoots acting like a demonstration site for what you can do on a homestead level and what you can grow in and around your house where people where students can take advantage of the learning that's going on up there and then but they have their privacy up there and having this be the more public space where you already have so many amenities and it's just a question of um enhancing them right yeah yeah yeah, yeah exactly yeah. something else i've thought about cindy was if, if there's some unneeded fencing out there, I don't know if I, I, we haven't we weren't able to walk out mm -hmm. way out into the property. Maybe there's some fencing that could go away oh, to help yeah. to help the wildlife. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. sorry. yeah. We don't we we just we're not attached to what's there. I need some grazing, you know, some yeah. some nice grazing so the animals are contained and so they don't tear up the land, but. Yeah, that was not a well designed. How much room do the llamas need? Here's another thing. If, if, if we don't want to mess with those geothermal pipes, we could take one of those paddocks off and move the greenhouse just to the north. Yeah. That's another solution that uh, you know, we didn't talk about. but that's Right, and we've definitely we talked about that, that is that we, we could certainly sacrifice yeah. these. The llamas love this one, yeah. but they could love this one instead. <laughs> they can learn to learn to learn. The number of animals I have, I don't. They don't need as much pack. I mean, I have much few, fewer than I used to. So um, this is a lot of way more pasture space than those five need. It gives them diversity because they get bored. Um, but yeah, some of that fencing can go away. Sydney. Uh, yeah. Was the geothermal put in by the previous owner? The first part of the geothermal was put in the, by the previous owner. The second was put in when we put the mother-in-law addition on. And, uh, and that's the geothermal that runs out to the, the greenhouse, it, or to that ridge. The like, uh, part that we see in the picture. Yeah, this is the newest. This is the, the I think, the new part. Where's of the, the newest part? I think know. it's back here. But that's been abandoned. No, it's still. I thought that, I thought that was part of that was abandoned. I don't know. I, I the geothermal thing is like I just get, yeah. you know I get after a while it's like well now here's a question thanks guys <laughs> is, is, if the geothermal lines are six feet under is there anything to preclude you from building a greenhouse on top of it yeah, yeah they're using a climate battery so we have to get down yeah. with it because yeah. that's cooling the ground yeah. it's heating the house well no, they, it wouldn't interfere if we could just stay above the geothermal right right, right. With and, the Oh, but then wouldn't you be getting heat from it? Wouldn't you be sharing the heat? Like, yeah, in a sense, good? yeah, we could be yeah. sharing that and also enhancing. I, you know, I think that we could, if we could determine that the, we, we could stay above them. And Michael, we we've done that before, where we had high water tables. We had to do a shallow climate battery, right? Okay. Or in two quarts well, instead of three. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and then we would put some in the upper beds. Could you just raise it a little bit too, like past the? Greenhouse, yeah, add a little bit of dirt there, and like the little higher, it's already low there. Could you just add a little dirt to like yours? Like you've added full higher than initially ground level was. Yeah, well, the thing is, we were trying to sink the greenhouse down into the, to the bank. So, or we just not sink it down into the bank, and then we would get it right, and then we just add. Then we would just add on top of it. So that's another option. Yeah. It's not to, not to uh, drum to the. Yeah, I've, I've seen cases where they've done geothermal that's not under the greenhouse. They just run it out underneath the field, just like you did your geothermal for your house. So it doesn't have to be underneath the greenhouse. So if, if that geothermal, you can... You mean climate, you, climate, climate battery. battery. That's what, well, that's what geothermal...